I want to thank God for everything that he is doing in this ministry at this particular time. Uh, and uh, I just want to let you know before I go into the message, because I don't want to forget it, uh, on tomorrow night, my wife and I will be starting our vacation. And uh, we won't be here next Sunday. We will be in Aruba. Uh, We will be in Aruba. Now, I want you to be at service more than you would be if I was here. I don't want you to stay at home because you say, well, I don't want to hear nobody else. Let me say this so you understand it. Whoever speaks, they won't be me, and they're not supposed to be me. They're supposed to be themselves and let God use them in the manner that he's going to use them. And I uh, want you to be here on time, start on time, get out on time, uh, and respect the person that's speaking. So Thursday night service will go on. Dr. Brown is going to fill in for me on Thursday night. Uh, so we are going to be here. Dr. Tresser is going to be filling in for uh, the 8 a.m. And uh, Elder Willisboom is going to fill in for the 11, and then someone else they have already on the program for the 6:30. But church goes on, and I uh, want you to understand and see God is doing uh, some things in this ministry, uh, some dynamic things. We had a person last month that gave us a donation, and said so we could use it uh, in what way we can. And you will see in a few uh, days uh, what that donation uh, we. Tr transcelerated into. And so all of these things is for the betterment of the ministry. And so learning how to locate your purpose in your problem. Now, as I said, if you don't have no problem, this is not a message for you. Uh, it's not a message. You can just leave because there's nothing you, if you don't have no problem, this won't help you. This is only for people that is like myself have some problems. <laughs> okay, if you don't have any, don't worry about it. Now, let me try to bring you up to date as, as to where we are. I give honor to Dr. Hardin and to the elders and to uh, our mothers and to all of you. Is there any visitors here this morning? I am glad to see Brother Maxie. He's been out for a while. Let's praise God for him. And I'm glad to see the Williams uh, back. Uh, uh, thank God for you all day. Uh, living a little distant now, but um, thank you for being here. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, that was good. I don't know, was that your first time? Oh, yeah. yeah, well, you never get a second chance to make a first-time impression. <laughs> and you did well. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> All right. All right, let me bring you up to date in uh, learning how to locate your purpose and your problem. Uh, this is lesson six, all of these on CDs. Now, I shared in part one, uh, there are three reasons why we have problems. Number one, they cause us to trust God. Number two, they force us to pray. And number three, they are tests. And part two, I shared every problem have a promise, and I gave you four major things that are required to receive those promises. Uh, one is obedience. Two is get rid of your worry. Three is draw near to God. And four, provision is in the promise. In part three, I shared uh, how not to allow your problem to control you. A lot of times we allow the problem to control us, but how not to allow the problem to control you. And I share with you seven things that you can do to shorten your time in the problem. And that is, number one, acknowledge the problem. Number two, take responsibility for your action. Number three, be willing to work. And number four, when you are wrong, admit it. And number five, forgive. Number six, control your tongue. And number seven, get rid of your pity pot. All right, in part four, I share some biblical principles that would help solve your problem. These would help solve your problem. And they are temperance. Number one, two was discipline. Three was self-assertion. And number four, the solution. You are part of the problem. You're part of the solution. Last week in part five, I shared with you some guidelines needed to help you receive the promise, some guidelines. So all I was able to get through last week was just one of the guidelines uh, that would help you get through. And then I gave you uh, seven things about faith. And I told you, number one, we already learned how we can connect ourselves in the problem. And determine how we connect ourselves in the problem determines how long we stay in it. 
Then number two, I told you the children of Israel was in their problem 40 years. Jesus was in his only 40 days. Then I ask you what made the difference. Jesus knew how to apply God's word when he was tempted. The children of Israel made a career of their willingness experience by refusing to obey God's direction. And number six, I told you, uh, 400 years they stayed in Egypt and was still, Egypt was still embedded in their heart. They was out of Egypt, but Egypt was not out of them. And number seven, I said, don't stay in your problem longer than you need to, longer than you need to. And then we come to part six today. I'm going to continue to share guidelines with you that you need uh, to understand. Now, think about one of the greatest guidelines we have right now, something we can't see, but we can hear it. And because we can hear it, 99% of us obey it. Sometimes uh, 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 where we're using our, uh, what, we, what I want to say, the thing is that peak is from the sky. Uh, navigation. navigation. But uh, when we're using that, we, we don't try to see who up there. We don't try to see where the voice came from. We just follow it. And if you go by the place, uh, the toy turn is that beep, beep, beep. If the next week, turn around, come back. You obey it if you want to get to your destination. Now, sometimes it sends you the long way, and if you're familiar with it, you'll go a different way. But it'll recalculate that way. Reset. Now, you obey that. You don't try to figure out how in the world does she know where I'm going or he or whoever. Normally, it's a woman talking. If they've got a voice of a woman. I guess if they put a navigator on there and then a man start talking, somebody get a little mad. You can't tell me what to do. But, <laughs> but it's the voice of a lady. And it takes you where you want to go. Well, guideline, that's a guideline. And thank God for it. Thank God for it. It'll make it easier. It don't even let you run by the place. When you get there, say, you have arrived. You have arrived. Now, all of that come from technology that God has given to man. But God already had all of this stuff and knew all of that before you got in your car. And, and before we got this, uh, there was time that you didn't know where you was going, but God guided you. I remember 40 some years ago uh, when my wife uh, came, from, we was living in Arkansas and she took a, uh, went to Sacramento. No, we were living in Long Beach and she went to Sacramento with the children. I went to Sacramento to be with my wife on that Friday night. They had been up all that week. And when I got off the freeway, I did not know which way to go. It was dark, and I said, Lord, get me to my sister's house where my wife is. And the Lord just spoke to my heart, go here, turn there, and I end up at her house. When I got ready to leave Sacramento in the daytime, I couldn't find my way back to the freeway. I stopped mad at somebody. But God brought me in at night without asking anybody, just following his direction. Now, I should have did the same thing on the way out. But I didn't. There was a distraction. So, we're going to learn today, uh, hopefully we will learn today, uh, is how to follow guidelines. The first one I gave you last week was faith. Guideline number two is diligence. Help us say diligent. Diligent is characterized by steady, earnest, and energetic effort. It has to be consistent. Diligent is like an intense laser beam focused on a specific goal. Now, some of you probably remember, we used to have magnifying glasses. The closer you are to the object, the larger it gets. But, and you can see it better. But if you want the power, we used to get in the sun and pull it back and let it beam on that thing until it burned it up. So the smaller it gets is more powerful. And the closer you get to it, you can see things. But just because you can see things, you don't, may not use the anointing. So when you use the anointing, God brings it back. And the further you get back from God so you can hear God and depend on God, and not try to read and understand what you can understand yourself, then it's more powerful. Lord, I need some help here. They missed the whole thing. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 says, Not as though I've already attained, either was already perfect, 
but I follow after. If that I may apprehend or lay hand on that for which also I am apprehended of Christ, or Christ have laid his hand on me, and I do forget those things which are behind and reaching forward for those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's something that you got to press for. You got to make an effort to do it. If you don't make any effort, it doesn't happen. You can say, well, I'm just a hoping and a praying. Sometimes you got to put some legs to your prayer. You got to get up off your knees and start to doing something. Not just sitting there waiting to my Lord, I'm waiting for you to do this and, and I'm, I, I want more money, God. And God give you some extra time on the job. You say, no, I ain't working overtime. Okay. So you just missed your blessing. You just missed your blessing. Now, Paul focused on the prize of the high calling of God. What we are focusing on, what gets our attention of what time is more often. Now, think about this. Whatever you're focusing on should be the thing to get your attention more often than anything else. Paul, Paul counted the riches of this earth as dung that he might please God who called him to be a servant. How diligent are we to our service to Christ? How diligent are we in our relationship with our wives, in the provision with our husband, in the protection for our family? Diligent is not an option. It is a command of God. Diligent is vital very vital. It's the guideline our, out of our problem. So if we don't use diligent to get us out of our problem, you're going to still have the problem. Proverbs 4 and 20 to 25, Solomon said, my son, attend to my word. Incline thine ears unto my sin. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life to those that uh, find them and health to all of thy flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of the heart are the issues of life. Put away the thief, put away from thee the forward mouth and a perverse lip, but uh, put forth the, put away from thee, and let thine eyes look on the look that I look on, and let thine eyelid look straight before thee. Now let's look at a few of these words that Solomon used here. And this first word, diligent, in verse 23. And diligent here means guard or a prison or a warden. Watch what you say. Your words have power. Your words it can give you life, or your words can bring death. So what you say is very important. It's a guideline. So how many of you seen people just have, just just have, with their mouth had no control, just said a whole lot of things, and then come back and tell me they were sorry? Y'all haven't had nobody ever. Have you ever had somebody to just go off on you? Yeah. And you said, what's wrong with him? I, what did I do? But they, they didn't let diligent control him out. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight forward. Now in verse 24, this word forward, this is the same as perverse lips, talking too much, using vain words. In verse 25, it said, look straight. And when you look straight, you're following righteousness and what's just. That's what God wants us to do. And so that's guideline number one. Contain your mouth, can be just, and understand that you there's something that you got to you got to help God do it. You God is not gonna do it for you. If you don't say the word, if you don't open your mouth, God will help you keep it closed. God will tell you, don't say nothing. Don't respond to that. And they say, well, why you didn't say that? Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to respond to it. Thank you. And you move on. Because if you start talking, how many know if you start talking? You don't know what you're going to say after that. Because then they give you another word, and, and then you, you, everything changes now. So your word changes your environment. Guideline number three, excellence. Help us say excellence. God has designed or created each of us the power to become great and excellent in what we do. Now, I know you say, wow, that, yeah, I, I just can't do that. God has designed us to do that. Notice what Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 said. Has thou not known? See, this is something that we don't know. We don't know that we can be excellent. Have thou not known? Have thou not heard that the everlasting God, the God the creator, creator of the end of the earth fainteth not. That means he never loses any strength. Neither is, ever, neither is weary. That means he don't worry about nothing. 
There's no searching of his understanding. You don't have to search his understanding. Then verse 29 says, he gives power to the faint. That means the weak. And to those that have no might, he increases your strength. So look, think about this. You say, well, I don't have no strength. God increases it. He increases your strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And they shall run and not be wearied. And they shall walk and not faint. God, this is what, did you not know it? This is what you don't know. Look at somebody and tell them, you don't know who you are. You don't know the power you have until you tap in the power of God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, 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 now. notice what he said. In, in, I gave you verse 29. Power from an unusual root word. This, this is an unusual root word from the Hebrew. It means produce, ability, might, strength, substance, and wealth. You have the power to get wealth. You have the power that you don't understand to get substance. You are, have more strength than you think you have. You're not a pushover. Your God didn't make us and save us and give, give us his Holy Ghost for us to be pushover. You're not a pushover. You are a man. You're a woman. Stand your ground in God. You didn't know that. Look at somebody and tell them that you didn't know that. Just keep reading and you'll find out who you are in God. In verse 30, he said, uh, that, 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 in verse uh, 30, he tells us about that the young men could faint and the, even the, the, the aged men going to do it. But they that wait on the Lord, uh, wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with what? Wings like an eagle and they shall run in what? and walk now 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 when you're walking don't faint here's what he was telling you he said uh, 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 they, you won't fail you won't stumble you won't stagger you won't become weak when you trust in God now this word weight in the Hebrew has a particular meaning in, 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 um, in the Greek it means to bear under kupomone bear under but in, in the, the weight in the Greek is bear under but in the Hebrew it means twist and tie up now, what he's saying, wrap around. Help us say, wrap around. If you're waiting on God, he said, wrap around and hold on. That's what it means. Wrap around and hold on. So whatever you're going through, wrap yourself around God and hold on to God. And God will bring you out. Some of you, most of you are not from the country, but in the country, uh, they would take the tomatoes and, and when they plant a tomato, they would put a stick beside it. And they would put, take the tomato when the van come up. They would take the and, and that, that, that tomato would come up and it would wrap itself around that pole. Yeah. So when the tomatoes get on it, it wouldn't pull it back to the ground. It would wrap around that pole and hold on. Yeah. Now that's what God wants us to do: wrap around God. Right. He's not gonna let you go. Yeah. I don't care if the wind come. I don't care if a storm come. That tomato plant stood up. Yeah. It was as strong as the stick that you put into the ground. Then there's another little plant that we call it the creeping Charlie. You see it every day if you drive and you don't even know what, why. You see, how, how can this little plant grow up on the cement wall and goes all the way up there and don't fall off? Because it clings to the wall and you have to pull it off. And when you pull it off, it left its print, print on that cement. Have anybody seen that? Well, you ought to hold on to God the same way. Wrap yourself around God and hold on to him and wait on God. That's what waiting means. Holding on and looking for hope and waiting for God to move. Believing him for the promise. Notice what David said in Psalm 16, 1 and 3. He said, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness. Extend not to thee, extend it to thee, but to the saints, extend not just to me only, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellency in whom is all delight. So David said, Lord, just don't give your strength to me, but give it to the saints that's in the earth. So David prayed for us while we, before we got here. Before we got here. Preserve them, God. Shema, meaning to guard, hedge us, protect us, trust 
mean to put our confidence in God and God want to extend his goodness to us. And Paul said in Colossians 3 and 17, and whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. One of the things that we don't, most of us don't do. We just said we're working in the church and we think we're just working and, and reason why the some refuse to do anything in the church. Well, I'm not getting paid for it and I'm not going to wear myself out. But you're working for God. Amen. There's nobody going to pay you like God going to pay you. Amen. You may think, see, God don't pay on every 1st and 15th and every other Friday. Amen. God may wait a year or two years I'm reaping things now that I've done five years ago. Five years ago. They're catching up with you. Don't ever think God forgets. He don't forget. But in due season. That's what he said in due season. You shall reap if you faint not. Faint not means you use strength and start talking against God. Everybody getting blessed with me and nobody ever tell me anything. They never thank me for what I did last year. No, I ain't gonna do nothing. God heard you. So you decide to do nothing, guess what? God don't do nothing. Nothing for you. You know why God don't do nothing? Okay, you know why? Most people don't know how to add. Nothing from nothing equals nothing. He have nothing to add because you did nothing. Okay, I'm sorry. Hmm. Somebody said, I didn't know that. Just try it. Go into the store with nothing and see what you can bring out. <laughs> it ain't hard. Just a little math. Go in with nothing and see what you can bring out. You come up there with the basket full of stuff and put it up there and you ain't got nothing. They won't even let you take the basket out of the store. They, tell, they put you out. Or call somebody to come pick you up. Stop wishing for your job to be easy. Let me tell you why to stop wishing for your job to be easy. This is a revelation for some, but smart folks already know what I'm going to say. Stop wishing for your job to be easy. Because if your job is easy, anybody can do it, and pretty soon you won't have a job. Okay, I'm sorry. Huh? Do that make sense? If your job is easy, anybody can do it. So, you won't have a job because they can get anybody to do it. Get something that they, somebody got a train to do. Amen. Let the divine spark of excellence explode within you to do your job with excellence. Excellence is not a product, it's not an act, it's not really a job description. Excellence is a way of life. It includes going beyond the norm, the normal call of duty, stretching out perceived limits, and holding ourselves responsible for our best. So excellent means that I'm giving it all I have and more. And more. Let me get you to understand something. The average person never, be, never enter into the world of professional things. Because the average person is just one step above below average. So you want to be above average. Those are the people that make it. The people that take that extra step. You know, it's the person that, 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 that have, is in a race and they're running and look like that they can't run no more. And all of a sudden they get a second win. Has anybody ever got a second win? You know, that second win is that win that you get. It's better than the first one. Because in that second win, you're not tired no more, and you got energy, and you don't even know you're tired until you get to the finish line. And when they get to the finish line, have you seen them just drop down? Drop down. Amen. Everything is just about out. They just drop down, but they won, or they came in second. They came in second. So you, have, you, you, you got some power in you that you don't even know. But if you never, get, you know, and here's another time that you can, you, your second win come in. You don't know how fast you can run until you're scared. You don't know how fast you can move until you're scared. 
Somebody scare you, you be the, you know, like the man, uh, it was, a man shot at him four times. And when they arrested the man, and he was in court, and the judge asked the man, said, you wanna, he said, the judge asked the man, said, where were you when the man shot the first off? He said, I was turning the corner. He said, where were you when you heard the second one? He said, I was halfway down the block. He said, where were you when you heard the third, the, the, the third shot? He said, you know, I didn't hear no third shot. He was moving. He was doing like, the, you know, they, they, they said that Cougar and uh, uh, Rabbit was talking. And the Cougar's supposed to be the fastest animal on the, on the earth. And so the Cougar was chasing him and they had got old and so they were sitting down talking to the Cougar and said, how in the world did you outrun me that day? And the Rabbit looked at him and said, you know what? You were running for a meal. I was running for my life. That make a difference. Okay. Okay, let me. So excellence, excellence caused you to run for your life. Excellence is simply doing our very best in everything, in every way, in every situation. Now, consider these four things that can help you. Consider your commitment. Help us say commitment. Now, Vince Lombardi, a lot of us know he was one of the greatest football coach. He said, quality of a person's life is in a direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their, cho their chosen field. If your commitment is not to excellence, your choice in your life is not going to be good. Now, number two, pay the price. Help me say pay the price. Real excellence does not come cheaply. A real price must be paid in terms of practice, patient, and persistent. I want you to say that with me. Say practice, patient, and persistent. And then natural ability. Press towards the mark. Number three, expectation. Exceed expectation. Go a step beyond the custom of ordinary. Give just a little more than normal. Bishop Gore said, God does not want you to do extraordinary thing. Come on, point to yourself and say, God does not want me to do extraordinary things. He wants me to do ordinary things extraordinary well. Did you get it? God don't want you to do just extraordinary things. He wants you to do extraordinary stuff, extraordinary, just, just ordinary stuff, extraordinary. Ordinary thing, just make it look good. As I heard uh, Ella Robinson is preaching, if you're just a street sweeper, yeah. where you said, do it what? Be the best at whatever you are. Yeah. So the people can say you're the best street sweeper they ever saw. Yeah. And never settle for just good enough. Now, let me read this. I, when I read this, I, I said, I got to tell them about this. Former Secretary of State Henry Kishner. How many of y'all remember Henry Kishner? He asked his aide to prepare a report for him. The aide worked day and night to prepare this report. He gave Mr. Kissner, after reading it, Mr. Kissner sent it back to him and said to him, redo it. The aide took, to, took it and several days later, he resubmitted it to Mr. Kissner. He was Kissner reread it, sent it back to the aide and said, redo it again. And the aide did it the, third, the second time and the third time. Mr. Kissing sent back again and said, redo it. The aide replied, I have completed this report three times, and this is the best I can do. And Mr. Kissing replied, in that case, I'll read it now. Yes, sir. Do you understand? When you do it the best you can, and you go that extra step, the man said, <laughs> this is the best I can do. So Mr. Kissing said, I'll read it now. Excellent come from, oh God help me here. Excellent come from striving, maintaining the highest standard, paying attention to little details, and being willing to go the extra mile. Yes. Guideline number four, knowledge. Help me say knowledge. knowledge. Second Peter chapter one, verse four through eight. Wherefore, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and pressure promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world, lust, and beside this, give all diligent, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue, knowledge, and to your knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brother kindness, charity, which is love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about these, these seven things that you put in you. This is what you got. This is a guideline. Knowledge is number one because all of these things spring from knowledge. And, and the Greek word for knowledge is genosis. Genosis. And, and, and that word genosis is it, it, the power of knowing. It's the power of comprehension. It's the, it, it's, it is the power of articulating and, and it's subjected to comprehension. Now, it speaks of what we know, both theoretical and experimental. You got to, there's something, when you know it, you're comfortable with it. If you don't know it, you're, you're uncomfortable. So if I would call on somebody to come up here and teach this morning and say, you come up here and say, you're nervous because you're something you don't know. You're afraid. Your, your, your fear is in you because you don't know how the people are going to take it. I may make a mistake. I may mispronounce a word. And there's so-and-so, so-and-so is here, and they may judge me. But that's because you don't know it. But if you know it, if you got the experience and you know it, you're not afraid to say it. In 2 Peter 1 and 2, he said, Grace and peace be multiplied unto, unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. If you want God's knowledge to multiply in you, get acquainted with him. Get acquainted with him. And then listen to what he says. Listen to God. Now listen, 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 look, look, look. And then Paul goes on to say, Paul didn't, did, did not want the saints at Colossians to be just knowledge, to have knowledge. No, he wanted them, and, and Paul used his word, uh, no. And when he used his word, no, see, I told you his genasi, it means to know. That's what, uh, that, that's the Greek word, genasi, mean no. But now watch what Paul did. Paul said to them, for this call, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with all knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the word knowledge here is not genosis, it's epinosis. Epinosis means this is extra. So you don't want to be just a normal thing. You want that extra knowledge. You want to know a little bit more about this word than the other person knows. Because if you know more about it, you can go a little farther. And don't you ever think don't ever think somebody is not watching you. Somebody you may not even know is watching you. Amen. They're watching you. Amen. And it just came to my mind and, and, and about my daughter. Jackie got two awards. The, what is the golden apple? One of the highest awards in the school. Because she went a little further. Volunteered a little more. Stayed a little longer. This is, what, this is how it happened. She didn't know and wasn't working for that. It wasn't even in her mind. It wasn't even in her mind. But God knows. So this word epinosis, which means super knowledge, full of discernment, full of knowledge of his will. And, 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 and watch this. The, the wisdom, we need wisdom and knowledge. Now wisdom is the word Sophia in the Greek. And what it means is it, 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 it's, it's the word that means it translates to fear, but it means deep knowledge, natural, spiritual, insight, hidden knowledge that God gives us. Wisdom come from God. Remember Job put in a search and said, where do wisdom come from? Lord, I need some help. Y'all remember Job did that? He said, where do wisdom come from? And, 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 and there was a long legacy. He said, it don't come from man. It don't come from what is grown. It don't come from your surrounding. Wisdom come from God. Heaven said wisdom come from God. And so if you want wisdom, ask God. Don't, don't go asking a professor. Don't go asking somebody else. Ask God. Because wisdom come from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wisdom is natural and moral insight. His research is a hidden thing. Then knowledge is a natural and moral thing. And knowledge, and knowledge and wisdom is the arrangement of understanding. Because without knowledge and wisdom, there would be no understanding. If you understand something, you can teach it. Because wisdom gave you the ability to catch it. Knowledge kept you, had it in your head while you know it. When you know it, you can teach it. So the arrangement of wisdom and knowledge is teaching. And all you'll get and get and understand it. God, help me here. 
So if you can't teach, read. Study to show your self-approval. That's what it said. He didn't say to show somebody else. Show your self-approval. It's no need to read the whole Bible and you don't understand the first verse. You don't have knowledge of the first verse. Take that verse. Read that verse. Get your good Bible dictionary. Get your uh, uh, Holman. Uh, uh, get your the Keyword Bible. And uh, get your uh, uh, one of the one that do some translation for you. Don't just read it in the English because the Bible was not written in English. It was written in Greek and uh, uh, and, and Aramaic, uh, uh, Aramaic Greek and Hebrew. Go back to the etymology of the origin of the word. Yes, sir. Study it. Study the word because a word is very important. It's very important. I've said this thousands of times. One word, one word in a sentence and a group of words make a sentence. A group of sentences make a paragraph and a group of paragraphs make a story. But if one word is off, the story is off. If the punctuation is off, the story is off. Oh, Jesus. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. The word understanding, help us understand it. And I want y'all to understand, I'm not using these Greek words in Hebrew. I'm just trying to get you, I'm teaching this. I'm trying to help you to get over. I'm trying to give you some guideline. And sometimes people go, I don't understand the word. Well, get the Bible and help and help understand it. That's why you don't understand, you don't study. And I'm teaching you, I'm trying to help you get through your problem. I'm trying to get you to locate your problem, your purpose, and your problem. I want to help you get out of it. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not here to hurt you. Many times you get the shot, you get a shot. A shot don't feel good. But they're trying to help you. Sometimes when they get a children shot, they cry. And the doctor asked me what I'm allergic to. I said, shots. <laughs> Sophia. And Paul said, an understanding. And the Greek word for understanding is the word synesis. And synesis with me put together in the mind. Knowledge and wisdom. Put knowledge and wisdom in your mind, you got an understanding. That's all it is. Sounds simple, but I'm telling you it's not. You know it's not. Because if you put knowledge and wisdom together in your mind, you could pass every test. There ain't nothing hidden in the test. You, you know it if you got an understanding about it. Some people come out and say, oh, it was nothing. You would say, oh, God, I swear on that. I don't know, did I get this in right or not? Whew. Now, arrangement. The arrangement of wisdom and knowledge so you can teach what you know. Yes. Wisdom and knowledge will cause you to hear from God the enemy's secrets. That's what wisdom and knowledge would do. Yes, the king was going to try to ambush the children of Israel. And every time he would think about it and tell somebody, God told Elijah what he was thinking. And Elijah would go to the king and tell the king, uh, sent to the king, tell him, don't go this way or don't do that because they got an ambush for you. And so the king of the Serebrum said, they, somebody in here is, a, is, is letting out my secret. Yes, somebody who, who is here is, is betraying me. And the man said, ain't nobody betraying you. He said, there's a man in Israel that God speaks to and tells him all of your secret. Tells them all of your secret. And in Deuteronomy, and I'm through with that one, giving you the next guideline. Deuteronomy 29, 29, you ought to write this down. He said, the secret thing belong to God. He ever said, the secret thing belong to God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. They, that they may do all the world, the word, the words of the law. So let's, the God got some secrets, but the thing that God have revealed to us is enough to get us out of our trouble. Guideline number five, patience. Help me say patience. Second Timothy 2 and 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hardness, patience, hupomone, abiding or remaining the same under pressure. I know I'm hurting and I'm going through but I'm not going to put these frowns on my face and yell at my coworker and holler at my children and holler at my husband and my wife because I don't like what I'm going through. You're not going to make it through it. You're not going to make it through it. James 1, 3 through 4 said, Know this, that the trying of your faith continues to work patient, but let, her, but let patient have a perfect work that she may be perfect and 
entire wanting nothing. Now, think about this. What you think is hurting you will cause you to not be wanting nothing. It brings you out of what you're in so you won't be wanting nothing. But patient have to have his complete work. So actually, patient is a job assigned to you. It's a job assigned to you that works on you to help you. And everybody that don't need working on, just raise your hand. All right, that's the source see. Everybody needs some working on. Now, we must learn to endure the wind of adversity for they lead us to the highest pinnacle of success. Now, let me tell you something. The harder the trial, the better the blessing. I told you all earlier, if you want a million dollars, you ask God for a million dollars, he's going to send you a million, million dollar problem. That's what you're going to get. Yes. A million dollar problem. Patient will carry us through the problem we are in to the provision we must have is always too soon to quit. Guideline number six. Help us in guideline number six. Interrogative. Help us in interrogative. Now, a lot of people, here's what interrogative is. Interrogative is like a code. It's a code of ethics. I will not do this. And, and every one of us on our job, even my job as a pastor, we have integrity. There are certain things that we won't do. Amen. There are certain things that your parents didn't write down, but yes. you know you won't do it. Amen. Even you're grown and you won't do it. Amen. You still remember what your mom or dad told you. You said, no, my mother told me never to do this. Yes, Grandma told me not to do that. That's integrity. That's the thing that will get you through. So there's some things. I don't care if you're in the dark. I don't care if you, um, wherever you are, don't make no difference. There are some things that you won't do. Amen. And there's some things that even your parents think that you won't do it. Sometimes they lie because you did it. My boy won't do this, but he did it. Yes, sir. But they, 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 they had that trust in you. Yes, They've had that integrity in you. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. And so this is what God wants us to understand. These are the things. So God has given you, he's given you your choice. He's given you the power to get through whatever you're in. Look at somebody say, I can go through whatever I'm in. Because God has given me the power to go through it. You're never alone. You're never alone. And, and, and I, could be, I could raise both of my hands because there's times that I felt that I was alone. I felt that nobody wasn't going through what I was going through. But when I realized that I wasn't alone and I realized that God was on my side, it caused me to stand still and to wait on God. When I say stand still, it, mean, it don't mean that I just stood there and sit there and say I'm not doing anything. It caused me to go back and reflect on what God said. When you're waiting on God, you're reading God's word. And I want you to understand something this morning as I get ready to close. Your name and your problem is in the Bible. I said your name and your problem is in the Bible. All you have to do in the dictionary, if you want to understand a word, you look it up. Is that true? And there are several meanings. There can be the noun, adjective, pronoun, adverb, conjunction, so you know in a part of the speech. So you want to know that this thing connects me? Or do it modify me? Do it, is, it, uh, is it a noun? Is it a person, place, a thing? What does this thing mean to me? Look it up. And find a scripture that puts you on the other side. That puts you on the other side. And one of the strippers that helped you to get to the other side, yeah. since you were slow about catching it, I will help you. There is no weapon formed. Now, do y'all understand the devil is working too? While God is working, the devil is working. The devil is forming stuff against you to fool you that he know that you're not going to know immediately. The devil is like the people that spike folk drink. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. See, I didn't go to the many parties because I got saved when I was early. 
But they used to tell me about folk coming to the parties and they have the Kool-Aid and all this stuff there and somebody post something in it. Spike it. Yeah. Some folks buy stuff, a Coke, like they're drinking a Coke. And I guess Coke is just in the, a little in the bottle to fool you. Yeah. But there's some stuff in there stronger than the Coke. That's right. That's right. I was working with a person that was doing that. He had that Coke and he just kept sipping the Coke. But I saw he changed. His eyes changed. He started turning red. He started talking stuff crazy. And I said, what's in that Coke? <laughs> oh, it ain't nothing, Reverend. But it was something else in that Coke. So the devil will spike stuff in you. Slip it in. Slip it in. Form it against you. He know what you, he, he, see the devil knows, but he don't know everything. But he know what you like and what you don't like. Amen. He know all of us have a trigger. The trigger is what the devil wants to pull. Yeah. He wants to push you and force you to that trigger. Yes, if it was cursing, he wants to force you to curse somebody. Amen. I will not ask, I would not dare ask you to raise your hand yes. as since you've been born again, born baptized, again. filled with the Holy Ghost, the mighty Holy Ghost and fire, uh, that you have not cursed. Right. I'm not going to ask you. Because I, I don't want to add a lie to a lie. Right, right. <laughs> Tell the truth. Read fast. But God. But God. Help us say, but God. But God. God was standing by. Yes. And, 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 and when you almost was ready to explode, the Holy Ghost had no weapon right. that been formed. This is something been formed against you. No weapon formed against me should what? Right. It's not going to take advantage of you. Yeah. Look at somebody say, I have a retardant in my body. It's the Holy Ghost. It keeps me from slapping a person. Y'all, 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 I'm, I'm going to talk to this side because y'all don't understand. Is there anybody here who understand what I'm talking about? It keeps me from slapping a person and cause me to go on my knees for him. I said I wasn't going to go on my knees. I'm not going to pray for you no more. Told that boy, that girl, your son, your daughter, I'm, if you do it again, I'm never going to help you again. So if you get in trouble again, I'm through with you. Don't even call me. But they got in trouble again. I just, is it, it, I, am I talking to some real folks? If, you, if you're real, if you're real, raise your hand. I know I'm not. You told them I'm not going to help you anymore. Don't even call me. But late at night, the Holy Ghost woke you up. So I go get that boy. Help that girl. Call him. Then you got to go through some crying, Lord. I told him I wasn't going to do that no more. They're going to make me look like a fool. But God said, go get him. I have some work for him that you don't know about. And then the Holy Ghost will bring to your memories. All things. Do you remember when you did such and such? And I brought you out. Is there anybody ever had the Holy Ghost to talk to you? Do you remember when you did this and you didn't know how you were going to get out of it? It was me. I brought you out. I brought you out of many things. I brought you out of the pit. And now you are somebody. Get up. Get up and go get that boy. In my closing, let me tell you the story about a man that you already know about. But it's just a little story to help you out and it's from the Bible. God told Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. Now think about this. You're marrying a prostitute. And you know what a prostitute do. But God said, marry her. Hosea was a prophet. Can you imagine the trouble you get into as a preacher marrying a prostitute? Somebody said he already knew her because that's why he married her. He just married her to get out of trouble. But God told him to do it. I need some help, Holy Ghost. And so he went and married a prostitute. And she kept on doing what a prostitute do. And she came and she was pregnant. And Hosea, the Lord spoke to Hosea and said to him, Hosea, says she's pregnant yeah. and the baby is not yours right. 
Lord, have mercy. The baby is not yours. But I want you to stay there. Yeah. Next child came. Yes, sir. And he said, Hosea, I got some more news for you. That one is not yours either. Jesus, I wish I had some trouble, some prayers here. So Hosea said, I can't take it no more. Yeah. And God said to Hosea, said, I want you to understand something. He said, there's nobody on the earth that understands what I'm going through. Yeah. He said, I'm giving you an example of what Israel is to me. He said, Israel have committed hold them among the nation, and yet I love them, and yet I haven't forsaken them. He said, go back, and I want you to get Gomer one more time. And he got Gomer again, and then there was a third child. He said, that is your child. That's your baby. You belong to me. And just like I, that baby is yours, you are my child. And you got a child now by a prostitute. And then she kept on whole mugging it. And then the Bible said Hosea put her out and said, I'm going to divorce you. And when the day came for the divorcement, they had her out on the market and they were getting ready to sell her. But her lifestyle, help me say her lifestyle, had caused her to wrinkle up. Her lifestyle, she wasn't looking sparkly good on now. Now she's looking old and wrinkled. Yeah. and nobody hardly wanted her but God said get up yeah. get up do you know sin to make you look old and ugly and nasty yeah. nobody want to have nothing to do with you yeah, I don't care you got yourself fixed up painted up but if you keep committing sin sin will mess you up yeah. and the auctioneer was auctioning her off and nobody yes. Kevin said nobody, nobody wanted to buy her but God told Goma, said, I want told Hosea, said, I want you to step up and get her. Yes. And take her home. And he, whatever he bid it, the auctioneer hit the thing fast because he couldn't get rid of her fast enough. <laughs> and he brought her home. Yes, he did. I want to tell you that you are almost at your end of your blessing. It's just one more bid. Yes, sir. One somebody you're leaving out. You're leaving out that person that you don't like. Yeah, yeah. You're leaving out the person that did you wrong. You're leaving out the person that said something about you years ago. And God's saying, you got to forgive that person so we can move on. I want to get you to the other side. And the only way I can get you to the other side is by you forgiving that person. And if you don't forgive that person and you holding them in the heart, that person is holding you. They're keeping you from that next step. And you don't even understand it. Stand your feet, everybody. These was guidelines. Awesome word, Pastor. It would get you to your place where your provision is. Thank you, Jesus. The guidelines. Thank you, Jesus. Excellent. Knowledge. Guidance that helps you. You can make it. Thank you, Jesus. You can make it. Yes, we can. Paul said, not as though I've already did it. But I press. If you had to walk to Los Angeles, you can make it. Yes, sir. You may not do it in a day from here. You may not do it in five hours or three hours or two hours like somebody that fast. But every day, just take a few more steps. And you can get downtown. I want to pray for somebody struggling. Struggling with forgiveness. Struggling with being who God wants you to be. Just one more river you need to cross. One more person you need to forgive. If you just come now, don't worry about nobody else. It's you that's losing the sleep. It's you that's losing the rest. It's you that need the help. Is there one here this morning? Man enough, woman enough, 